Well, good morning, Southside Bible Church. Um, we are going to pull out of Philippians this morning, so it takes a lot of self-control for me to hold off in the middle of a passage like that. We, we needed that he was raised above every other name, uh, but we have a, a guest uh, preacher who is at our church now for several, several years through college, and he has been, God's been putting a call on his heart to the mission field. And so this morning, I wanted him to come and bring you the word, and we would have waited a week, but his wife is due to have a baby, and uh, he gets a little nervous when he preaches, so I wanted to not give him that burden of a baby about to pop and (laughs) preaching. So uh, this morning, what I want us to do is to be praying for our dear brother. I, I, I pray your joy is like mine. When you see a young man being raised up that wants to give his life to preach this word to God's people. I pray that your hearts rise in worship and sing. And so this morning, I just want us to be praying for him and and just listen to the word of God. We're going to be in John 16. And so Royce Abel, if you would come and bring us the word of God, brother. Let's go, baby. Even brought his fan club. Good morning, Southside Bible Church. Um, it's, it's an honor to be up here and to bring the word this morning. Um, it's just an honor to see so many friendly faces and, um, and yeah, people who, who want to know God through his, through his word this morning. Uh, well, as, as Ken said, my name is Royce, and, uh, and if I haven't met you yet, I would, I would love to meet you today after the service. Uh, so if you would... Please turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 16. John 16, starting in the middle of verse 4 and going through verse 15. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Please pray with me. Father, you are glorious and gracious. Thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for the living word, Jesus Christ. And thank you for the written word inspired by your Holy Spirit. Father, by your Holy Spirit this morning, please show us the Son Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, please work in every heart this morning. Please show us the Son. That is our cry this morning. Holy Spirit, for those who, who know you, please illuminate the Son uh, to, your, to, to their hearts. Holy Spirit, for those who don't, please bring conviction. Please show them their own sin. Please show them their lack of righteousness, the coming judgment, and please lead them to the Savior. God, please help us see Christ this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we start, a question. Is it better that Jesus is gone? Is it better that Jesus is gone? As we know, Jesus has gone away out of this world and he's left us, his people, behind here. And so is it really better that Jesus is gone? Jesus himself gives the answer. 
in our passage this morning? And the answer is yes, but why? Why is it better that Jesus is gone? Why has this been good news for the people of God throughout millennia? Why is this good for us as the people of God this morning? So please journey with me, and may the Lord reveal deep truth to our hearts this morning. First, I want to set a bit of context for John 16, and to, to borrow the pastor's favorite phrase, there's so much here that the context itself could take a whole sermon, <laughs> but we don't, we, don't, uh, we don't have time for two sermons, um, and so in order to arrive at our text this morning, uh, we'll have to move a little bit quickly and, and only touch on those bits of context that are, that are critical to our understanding of the text. The Gospel of John was written by John the Apostle, the beloved disciple of Jesus. And as John was beloved of Jesus, so his gospel account has been well-beloved by Christians throughout the years. And, and John's gospel is very different from other accounts. And, and one, of its unique, one of its uniquenesses is that John the author clearly states his purpose in writing the book. John 20, 30, and 31. John says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he wrote his gospel account so that his readers would see Jesus, all of him, his life, his work, his signs, his words, and that by seeing, they would believe in him. And so for this reason, John crafts his, his gospel account just a little bit different than the other gospel writers. And, and one such difference is the, is the special attention John gives to Jesus' words the night before his passion. Christians refer to this section in the book of John, 13 through 17, as the upper room discourse. The location of this conversation between Jesus and his disciples is, you guessed it, in an upper room. And so because of that, it gives it its name. I would say that that nowhere else in the Gospels is such an intimate time recorded between Jesus and his disciples. There's no crowds, there's no religious leaders, there's no duplicitous question askers. It's just Jesus and his disciples, and he takes them and sits them on his knee, so to speak, and he teaches them one last time about himself and his work. And, And this is really the last time we get this sort of teaching because what's happening the next day? Over and over, Jesus speaks to his disciples about his departure from this world. He mentioned it over the course of his his ministry, but the frequency picks up on this night. Jesus is keenly aware of what is about to happen. John 13, 18, Jesus says, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. And then a few verses later, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And so he he knows that the betrayer is with him at the table and that he will soon dismiss himself um, and then that he and his disciples will go to the garden of of Gethsemane. And from there, Jesus knows of his arrest, his trial, his beating, and then his death on a cross. Jesus willingly endured his passion, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, for the forgiveness of sins so that any who repent and believe will have eternal life. But Jesus also knows of his resurrection on the third day and his ascension to the Father not not long afterwards. Jesus rose in power, And God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, proving every word he ever said and vindicating every claim he ever made, that he was both Messiah and the Son of God. And so I I ask again, is it better that Jesus is gone? And what I really want to help us do this morning is put ourselves in the place of the disciples. Try to get into their shoes, so to speak, or... Uh, maybe try to get out of their sandals, have your feet washed, and then sit and recline at table with the Savior. So let's, let's take a tour of the disciples' hearts. You've been called by Jesus to be his follower. You've left your old life behind. 
You've seen Jesus with your physical eyes and to some degree with spiritual eyes. And, and through shadow, you know some truth about Jesus, although the puzzle pieces aren't quite fitting together. You've spent years of your life following Jesus, your Lord and leader. And just this night, during this upper room discourse, you've heard him say things like, little children, yet a little while I am with you. You'll seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. And so, still in their shoes, or out of their sandals, you're, you're putting a few more of those puzzle pieces together. Jesus is soon going away, you can't follow him, and yet in some way you see him, or you will see him. And so understanding these things, I would speculate that you might be asking some of these questions. What's going to happen to us? Who will take Jesus' place? Who are we going to follow? Okay, put your own shoes back on. And just, just a caution, don't, don't hear me say that we right now, in 2024, are just like the disciples. We're not but they will soon be without Jesus physically among them. And so we are like them in that Jesus is not physically among us either. So to you all, I ask those same questions. What is going to happen to us without Jesus? Who has taken Jesus's place? Who do we now follow? Try to feel this, this urgency. He's leaving. What's gonna happen to us? The king has left. What's gonna happen to the kingdom? The army general is gone. What's going to become of the army? The CEO is absent. What will happen to the company? On this last night before his passion, Jesus reveals to his disciples the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity and the one to carry on the work of Jesus on earth. Over the course of, of my study of this text, God showed me just how central the Holy Spirit is to this upper room discourse. Yes, he's only mentioned by names, by, but by name four times throughout the, disc, throughout the discourse, but I would say that he's, he's the thread that, that runs through the whole conversation. From spurring humble Christian service and empowering new covenant love, to acting as the means of a believer abiding in Christ as a branch and a vine, to making the followers of Jesus one with both Jesus and each other, after he's gone. And so here Jesus' answer to the disciples and his answer to us this morning, what's going to happen to us? The Holy Spirit's going to happen to us. And now for your outline for this morning. The position of the Holy Spirit, verses 4b through 7, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, verses 8 through 11, and the declaration of the Holy Spirit in verses 12 through 15. And I, I couldn't come up with any fun acronym or cute alliteration, so the best I've got is a shun. Position, conviction, declaration. So we'll, we'll go with it. Okay, the first point, verses 4b through 7, the position of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. Well, what things, Jesus? Jesus here means his going away to a place where the disciples could not follow. Jesus did not speak much of his departure previously because it was not near, but now it is. Now it's near. None of you asks me, where are you going? Jesus' claim of the, disciples not asking the, uh, of the disciples not asking this question highlights their complete and utter lack of understanding of what he's telling them. They're, they're throwing questions and completely missing the mark. And so to, to use a theological expression, they couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. They're, they're asking questions, and, and they, they seem like good questions, uh, and, and they're even using some of the right words, but they're not asking the right questions. And so Jesus, who knows their hearts, he, he gives us a peek, a little peek behind the scenes of, of why they might be asking this question in the next verse. 
Jesus says, none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. And so Jesus is revealing that they're not asking questions with any sort of right understanding because sorrow has filled their heart and potentially blinded their eyes. And, and hopefully you can feel that, that their sorrow was surely genuine. Um, try, to, try to step out of their sandals again. Jesus is leaving, they don't know where he's going, and they can't follow him. And so it, it, it makes sense that, that they're sad about this. But then Jesus says something that they do not expect. He says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So truthfully, it's better that Jesus goes. Jesus explains, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So the helper will come. The Greek word translated helper in the ESV is paraclete. And we know him most commonly as the Holy Spirit. A Greek lexicon says that the word paraclete means one summoned, called to one's side, called to one's aid. So in the, in the wider sense, it means helper, aider, assistant. But it can also have the implication of, uh, in, a, in a legal sense, of a, of a pleader or an advocate. So Jesus will send the paraclete, the one to help, assist, come to the side of his people. But not only will Jesus send the paraclete to be with his people, he will send the paraclete to be in his people. See the difference there. Listen to these verses. John 14, 17. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Romans 8, 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, catch this, dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. 1 Corinthians six nineteen, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? The Holy Spirit dwells in, fills, takes up residence inside the believer. It is important to see the difference between Jesus the Son, the second person of the Trinity, and the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. To be consistent with church teaching throughout time, the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Son. They are, they are distinct persons. And yet there's so much New Testament language that speaks to Jesus within his people. We are in Christ, and this by his Holy Spirit. I've, I've heard it said that Jesus within is better than Jesus without. There, there's such a sweet continuity between the ministry of the Son and the ministry of the Spirit. And so it's perfectly consistent with Scripture to say that Jesus dwells within his people by the Holy Spirit. And so what will be the position of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit, the paraclete, will dwell inside God's people. And this is why it's better that Jesus is gone. Flip with me to Acts 2. Acts 2 tells the story of Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit filled Jesus' disciples, and after which Peter preached possibly the best sermon ever, ever preached. Acts 2.1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So when the paraclete, claim, when the paraclete came, he filled the disciples. He came with power and signs and clarity. The disciples were made bold to speak about Jesus without fear. So think of Peter for an example. He goes from denying Christ to boldly preaching Christ. And this transformation is all and only by the indwelling of the paraclete. And so before moving on, one, one question of application. Is God, by his Holy Spirit, 
dwelling inside of you? Answer with honesty. If you are a believer in Jesus here this morning, the answer is yes. And so for you, trust that Jesus within is better than Jesus without. Fight, fight that desire of, if only I could have been alive when Jesus was on earth. Fight that desire because Jesus says we have it better. Jesus himself it said it was better to have the paraclete. And then by means of application, if you're not a believer in Jesus, there's only one way to get the Holy Spirit, to get the paraclete inside of you, and it's by simple faith. Believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. Be united with him in his death and resurrection and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Our second point for this morning, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, verses 8 through 11. Flip back with me to John 16. We've, we've looked at a, at a profound truth that the Holy Spirit is inside of God's people. We've looked at his position, but now I want to transition more to his role in looking at the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It is becoming abundantly clear throughout the night that the disciples will have an important part to play once Jesus is gone. And so I ask again, is Jesus being gone, is Jesus being gone really better? Is it really better? for them in accomplishing the work that Jesus has given them to do? And again, the answer is yes. It is really better that Jesus is gone. Jesus will go, the paraclete will come, and it's better for the, for the disciples to be a part of the paraclete's ministry. And when he, the paraclete, comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And for, for this point, we'll need to get a bit technical, so stay, stay with me. First, he will convict. The word translated convict is eleko. A Greek lexicon says that the word eleko means to convict, refute, confute, generally with the suggestion of the shame of the person involved, the person convicted. Another definition would be to find fault with or correct, either by word or deed. And so it's, it's, it's best for us to understand this word in the personal sense. And yet, just as a caution, I would, I would like to say that personal does not mean subjective. The conviction of the paraclete is right and objective and true. D.A. Carson, in his commentary on the book of John, says that this word speaks of shaming the world and convincing it of its own guilt, thus calling it to repentance. And so this isn't out there. This isn't somebody else's problem. This is close and personal. This is in your own heart so he will convict who? The world, not the saints. And the conviction of the world will be concerning three things specifically, sin, righteousness, and judgment. And so due to the text's parallel construction, it is most easily understood that those three charges are all associated with the world. The world's sin, the world's righteousness, the world's judgment. And so briefly, come with me to the courtroom. There are three criminal charges being brought against the defendant, theft, arson, and vandalism. It, it may seem obvious, but those three charges are most easily understood as being associated with the defendant. It's not the judge, it's not the jury, it's not the clerk, it's not the prosecution. It's the defendant's theft, the defendant's arson, the defendant's vandalism. And I know this may seem simple, but I say this to highlight that it's most natural to read this verse with those three indictments pertaining to the world. The world's sin, the world's righteousness, and the world's judgment. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So keep, keep journeying with me. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. The paraclete brings conviction of sin because the world does not believe. And so not believing in Jesus, the righteous one, God's Messiah, that is in itself a sin, but I, I, don't think, I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about here. It is true that unbelief causes sin. It is true that the people of the world who don't believe in Jesus, they live in and they love their sin. And yet it's also true that sin can cause unbelief. So there, there's so much nuance here. Um, 
we don't have time to, un to unpack all of it, but uh, just, just a few observations and a few examples. Take Jesus talking to the woman, of, the woman of Samaria in John 4, for example. When Jesus is talking to her, Jesus, he shifts the conversation from living water to her relationship life. And, and that may seem a little strange, but what Jesus is doing, he's identifying a sin in her life. And he's, I, I, he's identifying it so that that sin might be addressed and belief can follow. One more example, Jesus talking to the rich young ruler in Matthew 19. As he's talking to him, Jesus, again, he shifts the conversation from the keeping of commandments to this man's personal finances. Jesus identifies a sin in the man's life so that the sin might be addressed and belief can follow. And so at this point, I want to be really clear about the remedy. What is the solution to this sin that, that stands in the way of belief? The remedy is repentance. It's not moral cleanup. It's not working to get rid of it. It's repentance of that sin. L let me say it again. The remedy is repentance. A sinner cannot simply work harder to get rid of, it, to get rid of his sin and win God's approval. It's just not going to happen. A sinner must, on the other hand, repent of that sin that stands between him and God. When he sees sin of any type as it truly is, as horrible and repulsive in the sight of a holy God and believes in Christ for the forgiveness of that sin, he is saved. Repentance and belief are considered two sides of the same coin in the New Testament. When one comes, so does the other. And so the helper convicts the world concerning its sin because they don't believe in Jesus for the purpose of removing the sin barrier and helping them to believe in Jesus. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. And this one may sound a little bit strange. The paraclete brings conviction of righteousness because Jesus is going to the Father. Well, what righteousness does the world have? Isaiah 64, 6. We've all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. Ph Philippians 3.9. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God that depends on faith. Titus 3.5. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. And so do, do you all see the air quotes over those righteousness uh, in, in those three verses? The world has a false righteousness, an inadequate righteousness, an insufficient righteousness. The world has self-righteousness, would be a way to say it, in that it thinks it has righteousness, but it doesn't. During Jesus' ministry, he convicted the world of its wretched and inadequate righteousness, a righteousness that fell infinitely short of God's righteousness and the requirement of God's law. Jesus the demonstration of God's righteousness on earth, he showed the righteousness of the world to be hopelessly insufficient. Jesus, the righteous one, you could say, showed up the world's righteousness. George Whitfield commentated, what is conversion then? In order to be truly converted, a man must become a new creature and be converted from his own righteousness to the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think we heard that in those baptism testimonies this morning. But now Jesus is leaving the world. And so the paraclete, both on his own and through the ministry of the church, convicts the world of its righteousness. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. The paraclete brings conviction of judgment because the ruler of the world has been judged. Jesus, when speaking to the Jews in John 8, says, says something very strong. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. The, the devil, in this context, is the ruler of the world. He is judged or has been judged. It's done. It's final. And so inasmuch as the people of the world are united indeed with the ruler of the world, they will be judged as well. That judgment is just as final. The conviction of the paraclete is to help people see that judgment is real and that it's coming for the people of the world. The disciples will be tasked 
with being the witnesses of Jesus to the world. So ask again, Jesus, are you sure it's better that you go? This seems like a tall task. And the answer is yes, for the paraclete will come and work powerfully in the world to convict of sin and righteousness and judgment. Consider a contrast. Jesus ministered in Israel, and because of his ministry, many people believed. But the paraclete will minister in the entire world through all of Jesus' disciples for all time convicting and helping people to believe in Jesus. So yes, it's better that Jesus goes. Flip flip with me again to Acts 2. Acts 2, 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So this is the conviction of the paraclete. This conviction cuts to the heart and it elicits a response. And now for some application again. First for the unbeliever. Do you understand that your sin is far greater than you thought and charges you as guilty before a holy God? Do you understand that your righteousness is far less than what you thought and it's counted as a polluted garment? And do you understand that judgment is absolutely certain? Is is the paraclete perhaps working in your heart even even this morning, convicting, poking? Do you you feel the weight of sin? Do you feel the judgment of God? Don't don't try to push it away if if you really do feel it. Deal with it by turning to the Savior. And then just one more thing before I continue. It can be difficult to talk about sin and judgment. I would say that our American culture has a pretty low tolerance for, for objective words about sin and judgment, uh, for fire and brimstone sort of language. I, th- I think part of it is a suppression of God and of truth and even a hatred of God. Uh, but considering some fringe groups counted as part of American Christianity, I do wonder if if we've seen a little too much fist thumping and a few too many fear tactics from the pulpit. I I wonder if we've seen one too many posters or signs held up by so-called Christians on the news that speak of hell and judgment. I even wonder if if we've seen too much self-righteousness of man and we've seen far too little of the person of Christ. In his commentary on John, D.A. Carson said, the convicting work of the paraclete is therefore gracious. It's gracious. It is designed to bring men and women of the world to recognize their need and so turn to Jesus. And so I want to say clearly and unequivocally that the paraclete brings conviction out of complete grace and love. Complete grace and love. I know that every other preacher in this pulpit seeks to bring conviction with the motive of complete grace and love. And it's my hope and prayer this morning that I have and am speaking with complete grace and love. Hate is not a part of the conviction of the paraclete. But if there's a problem, a big problem, a genuine problem, it's gracious to supply the answer. Sin is a big problem, so it's gracious to supply the answer. The answer to the problem of sin is Christ. The answer to the problem of inadequate righteousness is Christ. For only by believing in him can you possess the righteousness that God requires. The answer to the problem of judgment is Christ, who took our judgment on himself when he went to the cross, so that we might not have to live under the fear of judgment ever again. So as we're talking about sin and righteousness and judgment and conviction, hear me that there is a Savior who saves to the uttermost, to the far reaches, to the the depths, those who would call on him in faith. 
If you're an unbeliever here this morning, your application is simple. It's to call on Jesus Christ in faith. Repent of sin, of false righteousness, and escape the judgment that is to come. Second, for the believer, do you believe what this text is saying? Do you believe that it's better for Jesus to go and for the paraclete to come and do his work of conviction? Do you believe that the paraclete has all power and all authority over the human heart to bring conviction leading to repentance and faith? Or do you doubt? Do you, do you doubt that work of the paraclete? And so if, if you're a believer here this morning, your application is to take God at his word and trust that he is in the business of leading people to, to salvation in Christ. Not just in Acts 2, yes then, but now. Believe that he's in the business of leading people to Christ. How big do you think? How big do you pray? Can the paraclete do his convicting work that leads to repentance and faith in fill in the blank? Family members, neighbors, coworkers. What about people ac- across the world who have never heard the name of Jesus? How many of these people? One neighbor or all your neighbors? One coworker or the whole office? Uh, one person in a country far away or the whole country? What can God do by his spirit? And so I, I confess that God has corrected my thinking in recent weeks. Uh, I was thinking far too small about the work of the, of the Holy Spirit. And so my exhortation for all of us, myself included, is to think big. Think big and then go bigger for the paraclete is still in the business of saving people and drawing people to Christ. So third point, the declaration of the Holy Spirit. Verses 12 through 15, flip back with me to John 16. Just as in conviction, I want to continue to focus on role in the declaration of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Jesus, who knows his disciples' hearts, knows that there's some things they just can't bear at present. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. The spirit of truth, in addition to the paraclete, is another one of John's favorite titles for the Holy Spirit. He, the Holy Spirit, is true. He is true God, coexistent in the Trinity, one with the Father and the Son, the same in nature, although distinct in person. And he will guide Jesus' disciples into all the truth. Consider two of the other paraclete passages from the Upper Room Discourse. John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And John 15, 26. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. The paraclete will guide Jesus' disciples into all truth as he teaches, as he brings to remembrance the words of Jesus, as he declares the Son to us. But the paraclete will not speak on his own authority, but rather on the, on the authority of the one who sent him. The paraclete will speak on the authority of the Son, who in turn speaks on the authority of the Father. John 13, 49, Jesus says, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. There, there's a beautiful cascade, so to speak, from the Father to the Son to the Spirit, each speaking on the authority of of the other. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So as we near the the end of our time, I want us to focus on the declaring work, the declaring role of the Holy Spirit. The helper takes what belongs to Jesus, and by extension what belongs to the Father, and declares it to the disciples of Jesus. And there's so much beauty here. What belongs to Jesus? Is it not his words, his witness, his atoning work, his radiant glory, the fullness of his person? 
The paraclete declaring what is Jesus's is declaring Jesus himself in all his fullness and grace and majesty. By declaring that which belongs to Jesus, the paraclete therefore brings great glory to Jesus. He shines a spotlight, helping the saints to see Jesus clearly. In a paradoxical way, it is, it is better than that Jesus goes away so that his people can see him. And I know it sounds strange, but only, only after Jesus departs do his disciples see and understand him clearly for who he is, the Son of God and Messiah. They, they got it through shadow, but only after he goes do they, do, they, do they really get it. When Jesus is among them, they see him physically with physical eyes. But when he leaves and the Spirit comes, for the first time, they see with truly spiritual eyes. I would argue, I would argue that believers throughout the millennia have seen Jesus more clearly by the declaring work of the Holy Spirit than the disciples with physical eyes. And, and Jesus says as much. And so again, yes, yes, it's better that Jesus goes away. We won't read it all due to time, but back to Acts 2. Uh, Acts 2, 14 through 36 records the, word of the, the words of Peter's great sermon at Pentecost. He was filled with the Spirit. And the paraclete revealed deep truth to his heart and gave him the words to communicate deep truth about Jesus to the hearts of his audience. Peter did not give his sermon with Jesus physically present. Peter saw and was a witness of the risen Christ by the powerful ministry and working of the paraclete. Only by the power of the paraclete did Peter understand and share the true gospel. Just as Jesus said, it is truly better that Jesus has gone and the paraclete has come. One final bit of application for the saints, and, and, and then I'll close. Believer in Jesus, what a wonderful, what a sweet, what a marvelous gift we have in the paraclete. Are you seeing Jesus? For some, the answer may be a resounding yes. For others, it may be a regretful no. Are you seeing Jesus? Perhaps the more helpful question is, what do you do when you can't see Jesus? I've, I've been through these times, and it's, it's really hard. One of the greatest exhortations of the Christian life is look to Jesus, and that's so good. It's, it's a worthy calling, and it's hard sometimes. Sometimes I can't see him. Even at different times preparing, preparing this, this sermon, I felt that way. Uh, I've, I've felt that way at various times over the past few months. God, I'm trying. I can't see Jesus. In God's word, I can't see him. In prayer, I can't see him. In corporate worship, singing, fellowship, service, I can't see him. God, I can't see him. And so in, in those times, uh, I think what the, really the only thing that's, that's helped me is calling out to God's Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, help me see Jesus. Please help me see Jesus. Saints of God, Jesus has departed from this world and returned to the right hand of the Father. We're sorrowful, and yet we know in our hearts that it is better this way, to see Jesus with the eyes of faith than to see him with physical eyes, to see him with the eyes of faith by the power of the paraclete, John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Let's pray. Father, by your Holy Spirit, please help us to see Jesus If we're seeing him, please help us to see him more clearly. If we can't, please help him to see us. At, uh, please help us to see him at all. God, please work in the hearts of your saints here this morning. Please declare your son to us. And God, please work in the hearts of any non-believer among us. God, in love and in grace, 
Please bring conviction of sin and righteousness and judgment. And God, lead many people to Christ. Please help us to trust the words of Christ that it is better for him to go and the paraclete to come. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.